so good to good morning everybody um, I'm required to use this very dangerous device uh, because I'm this is recorded for posterity as Michael Lacerna said which of course means that my introduction will be far more uh, uh, well uh, let's 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 formal is a good word thank you for helping out here <laughs> uh, a bit more formal than it would have been otherwise uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Donna Shillington to you her first visit to our campus um, Donna is a marine uh, geophysicist. Uh, she's particularly interested in active source seismic studies uh, of continental margins uh, and other uh, parts where in the past tectonic activity has taken place. Um, you may see that uh, her funding in part comes from the National Science Foundation program called Geoprisms. Uh, that's a big community effort as well as a funding opportunity to study continental margins. Um, and it's a, a decadal program uh, that really tries to do interdisciplinary science that crosses the shoreline. And uh, that's something that's rather unique within the National Science Foundation. And uh, Donna kind of embodies on the seismology side uh, very much that shoreline crossing part where she does work in uh, uh, continental margins, both on the, uh, on the ocean as well as on the terrestrial uh, side. Um, she also works on the subduction zone side, where the convergent margins are, and the rifting side, which for example is being studied in uh, Lake Malawi. Uh, she will be talking, as uh, the title is clear, about the Alaska subduction zone. Uh, Donna got a PhD at the University of uh, Wyoming, uh, which probably inspired her to become a marine scientist. Um, she afterwards uh, went to, uh, to Southampton in England, which is the premier uh, oceanographic institution there, uh, and then uh, joined Le Mans as a, a research scientist where she's been ever since, uh, and clearly Le Mans uh, has taken up the tradition of, of seagoing uh, expedition. Don was very interested in uh, the history of the Carnegie, uh, so I rang the bell a little bit more loudly for her. My apologies if your ears are still ringing. Um, so with that, Donna. Very formal introduction, Peter. I can thank the broadcasting system for the sparing me the less formal one. Um, and yeah, thanks to all of you for, for being here. I'm really pleased to have my be having my first visit to, uh, to Carnegie. So uh, today what I'd like to uh, tell you about is some work that my colleagues, this lovely group of people here, and I have been doing uh, studying the subduction zone off of Alaska and hopefully learning things about subduction processes in general. But I especially wanted to acknowledge um, my close collaborator, Anne Bissell, who's a um, Lamont research professor, and Jiao Li, a former PhD student who contributed a lot to this work. So um, subduction zones. Uh, we know that um, most of the activity on our planet is occurring around plate tectonic boundaries. This includes both volcanism and, um, and, seism and seism seismic events. So uh, this is a map showing uh, earthquakes around the world. And um, you can see that these earthquakes are delineating mid-ocean ridges as well as um, subduction zones. And the last um, 15 or so years has given us a lot of reminders that subduction zones produce some of the largest earthquakes, the largest earthquakes on the planet, as well as the most tsunamogenic earthquakes on the planet. Uh, so these stars are showing some of these big, notable um, recent events, um, particularly the 2004 event off of uh, Sumatra, and um, more recently the um, 9.1 uh, 9 event that happened off of Japan. And you know these events, of course, that cause you know, large, great earthquakes and subduction zones, cause a lot of ground shaking but are also associated with really destructive tsunamis. So I'm sure everyone has seen many pictures like this, but um, this is the tsunami from the 2011 Japan event um, inundating the uh, part of the, the shoreline there. And so you know, understanding these processes, both from a hazards point of view and for a fundamental understanding of our planet, you know, really motivates our work and the work of many other scientists. And so um, you know, one of the things that, that we really wanted to understand in the work I'm going to show you is you know, what, are the, what controls the variations and properties on the plate boundary in subduction zones that control the, the size of an earthquake you can have and also its poten potential for tsunamogenesis. So um, this cartoon on the left is just sort of showing a, a cutaway looking at a representation of the actual plate boundary where um, earthquakes are occurring in subduction zones. And so these sort of darker gray areas are indicating um, unstable asperities, um, where we imagine that um, uh, the plate boundary is locked and, and that earthquakes um, rupture. Uh, these sort of gray areas are showing 
um, what's called conditionally stable areas into which um, slip that initiates in these patches could uh, propagate. And the white colored areas are showing places that we think are um, aseismic, either because they're you know, a bunch of weak and fluffy sediments or areas where you have at, at greater depths with higher temperatures and pressures where um, ductile deformation dominates. And so one of the things that controls how large of an earthquake you can have is the size of the area on the plate boundary that binds up and then ruptures in a great earthquake. And so understanding the kind of distribution of the dark gray and the light gray here is really important for that. And one of the things that really controls how tsunamogenic an earthquake can be is how shallow that um, slip during, during an earthquake is, both on the plate boundary itself or on faults that are in the, uh, the overriding plate. And so what I'm going to tell you in this talk, as you might guess from the title, is that um, from what we've seen and, and consistent with a, a number of other researchers, um, that what comes into the subduction zone, the, the diet, uh, in terms of the um, sediments on the incoming plate and water stored at a variety of levels in the incoming plate, is having a big um, influence on these variations in properties and on um, seismic behavior. Um, these inputs are also important, I think, for other things. Um, as uh, I'll talk about a little bit as well. So, you know, of course, water um, transported into the subduction zone um, within this plate can influence processes at a, at a variety of depths. But, of course, that um, as many people here are more expert in than I am, can um, drive um, magmatism beneath um, island arcs and also um, contribute to other things like intermediate depth earthquakes, which we'll talk more about as well. So, we think that these inputs are, are really very important. And so maybe it's not so different from humans, which may also be influenced by their bad diet. So um, we can wonder how America's diet may have affected our behavior over the last, uh, last month. But um, anyway, so the subduction zone diet is really, um, as I said, sediments and faulted and hydrated oceanic lithosphere. So at different subduction zones around the world, we have varying um, thicknesses and compositions of sediment that are deposited on this incoming oceanic plate and being subducted, you know, brought into the subduction zone. But the other big ingredient, a very important one, is, um, is water. And so water can be stored in the, the pore space of uh, sediments, of course, but um, can also be stored within the oceanic lithosphere. So um, at the, the outer rise of subduction zones, the incoming plate bends and goes down the hatch. And so the kind of surface manifestation of that bending process is the formation of um, normal faults, which you can see here in um, bathymetry data off of, the, um, off of the Central American subduction zones. And these um, bending faults, these normal faults, are thought to be pathways for water down into the plate. And so um, this is a, a beautiful uh, image from um, Samer Nape's work um, showing the um, conductive structure, of, or here in resistivity structure, of the uh, oceanic uh, lithosphere. And, um, and hopefully you can see that these sort of lighter blue areas, which are more conductive, um, and these have been interpreted as, as fluid going down into the, in the oceanic crust. So we have a number of lines of evidence that these faults are pathways for water into the plate. So we've got sediments and water stored at a, at a, variety, of, a variety of levels. And so once that water is subducted and those sediments are subducted, we think they could have you know, a variety of different important controls on processes at depth. And so one big thing that they can do is control the properties of the plate boundary um, you know, within and around the area where great earthquakes occur. And so this is an image um, off of New Zealand um, showing estimated um, elevated pore fluid pressure for fluids that were carried into the subduction zone um, in, in within, primarily within the sediments. And, the, um, and then these elevated pore fluid pressures are thought to control some interesting slip behavior that's happening on the shallow part of this plate boundary. Um, and then, of course, some of the water, depending on where it's stored in the plate and what the temperature structure of the plate, can be carried to greater depths. So hopefully this figure is familiar to you from um, your colleague, uh, Peter. But um, depending on how hot the plate is, um, water can be transported to different depths. So uh, for very hot subduction zones, where you have young oceanic lithosphere going down the hatch, um, uh, plates uh, can give up their water uh, very er at shallower depths. So this is showing um, each of these lines is a different subduction zone. And we're looking at cumulative water loss with depth. So these kind of kicks out to the right are showing um, dehydration, basically. And so 
yeah, places like uh, Cascadia or, um, or other very hot subduction zones give up a lot of water early, but colder ones can transport it to great depths. And so um, water carried to depths, of course, as I mentioned before, can have an influence on things like um, subduction zone magnetism, but also on, we think, maybe intermediate depth earthquakes. And so these are earthquakes that are occurring at pressures and temperatures where you wouldn't normally expect um, seismic slip to be possible. But one, um, and so this is sort of cartoonized um, on this nice figure from uh, Brad Hacker, but one idea is that you know, water stored in hydrous minerals within the subducting lithosphere dehydrates, locally elevates the pore fluid pressure, and enables um, seismic slip to occur. So anyway, I've just sort of run through a, a few examples of, of how we think that water and other ingested material may influence subduction zone behavior. But one of the kind of interesting things is that as if we look at a global scale and we try and correlate um, you know, where, where we think water will be or where we think it will be dehydrating with, um, with the behaviors that we think it's meant to control, um, sometimes we don't see the correlations that we would wish for. So um, this is a, from a study by um, Grace Bartek and colleagues where they did a nice and simple thing. They said, okay, uh, you know, so let's say that, let's test this idea about intermediate depth earthquakes being caused by dehydration reactions. So we'll go around the world and tally up, you know, the number of earthquakes happening per year, per kilometer of subduction zone in different depth ranges and see how that relates to where we expect dehydration reactions to occur based on the kind of thermal models I showed you in a previous slide. And I'm sure that they wish they were going to see something positive <laughs> correlation here, and they didn't. And so, and there's been a few other kind of more global studies that have tried to um, make correlations between these things that we think are important for subduction zones and how they actually work, and they, and they haven't worked out. And um, so we could say, all right, maybe these inputs aren't as important as we thought they were, or that there are other factors that weren't, you know, captured in this um, very nice but, um, you know, simple kind of approach to looking at at uh, controls on subduction zone processes. And so um, this is certainly what I'm going to argue to you um, today. All right, so to kind of think about um, subduction zone inputs and subduction zone behavior, I'm going to take you to the uh, Alaska subduction zone. Um, this is a very seismically active place. Almost the entire um, plate boundary is ruptured in great earthquakes in the last century. So. Um, you know, th here the Pacific plate is subducting to the north beneath the North American plate. These big pink blobs are showing the um, estimated um, rupture areas of past earthquakes in the last century. So a very notable one was the 1964 earthquake, which goes from, um, what was a 9.2, 9 the second largest instrumentally recorded earthquake ever. But, you know, a number of other, you know, very sizable ruptures along the rest of this plate boundary. Um, one very conspicuous exception, of course, is this spot. And this is called the, uh, the Schumigan Gap. Um, and there hasn't been a great earthquake here in over 150 years. And it's right next door to a place called the uh, Samiti Segment, which seems to regularly crack out you know, great earthquakes every 50 to 75 years based on historical records. Um, so, and otherwise, the kind of configuration here, there's not a lot that's changing over this little piece of real estate. Um, so if we look in this area in um, a little bit more detail, we can see that a lot of other things are varying as well. So this is a very busy figure, but um, let me walk you through everything on here. So just for reference here, again, are these estimated rupture areas. Um, and uh, shown in the background is uh, seismicity from the Alaska Earthquake Center's catalog, um, color-coded by depth. Um, and another thing you can see changing between the Schumigan Gap and the Samiti segment just visually is the number of earthquakes, like the amount of seismicity occurring at a variety of depths, where you have less over here in the Samiti segment than you do in the Schumigan Gap. Um, another thing that seems to change between these places is the amount, the degree to which the plates are locked and uh, bound up. So um, in the Samiti segment, this is based on onshore uh, GPS data. In the Samiti segment, the plates seem to be highly bound up. So you know, of the expected <laughs> motion between these two plates, they're, they're really stuck, like 90% stuck. Um, whereas in the um, Schumigan Gap, it seems to be more weakly coupled to freely slipping. So all of this is changing over this, um, this small area. And so we thought this would be an excellent place to 
go and try to understand controls on, on plate boundary behavior and, um, and plate boundary properties. So in um, 2011, um, we conducted an active source seismic experiment here. These um, red lines are showing um, places where we collected um, seismic reflection data. Um, and then we also collected um, refraction data along these two profiles. So the, the red circles are showing um, ocean bottom um, seismometers. And so I, I feel bad to introduce you to active source seismic data after I just saw in the Carnegie Library some of the, the tapes for the first controlled source data ever collected. But nevertheless, I'll just quickly give you an introduction to make sure we're on the same page. But um, the way this works is that we uh, cruise along in a boat. Our, the length test does not look like this. Um, we, and we tow uh, um, an array of air guns, which I'll, I'll uh, show you some more pictures of those. Um, and, and they emit uh, a sound, uh, sound waves, which travel down and bounce off of different layers in the Earth. And we can uh, record more vertically incident arrivals on a long um, array of hydrophones towed behind the ship to collect seismic reflection data. And these data, as hopefully I'll show you, are really powerful for imaging faults, sediments, and fine scaled structure. Um, but you can also record those sound waves on autonomous um, ocean bottom seismometers or land seismometers. And so with these longer um, source receiver offsets, you can record um, refractions through and reflections, uh, wide angle reflections off of um, different boundaries, which are really sensitive to uh, the seismic wave speed of these, of, of different layers in the Earth. And so they are very useful for building um, velocity models for broader scale structures. All right, so um, for this work, we used the, um, the Langsith. This is the US um, Marine Seismic um, Facility. And uh, she's operated uh, by Lamont. And um, for this cruise, we had two eight kilometer long um, streamers, um, with each with 636 um, uh, receivers, and uh, the large tuned air gun array of, of the Langsith. Now she can actually tow a streamer up to 15 kilometers long, so I'm really eager to go back out and collect new data with that. Uh, but just to show you a few pictures, uh, here are the um, ocean bottom seismometers we used. These were from um, Scripps Oceanographic Institution. Um, uh, the yellow part is um, a series of is the floats, a bunch of um, glass spheres. All the important stuff is, is mostly in here, the data logger, batteries, and the, um, and the um, seismometer. And you have like a little radio. Uh, a light and a radio um, beacon here on top. And so we put out a, a number of these along along two of our lines. Um, the other uh, instruments we used to record seismic signals were um, a, some seismic streamers. So oops, <laughs> they're towed on the or stored on these gigantic reels on the back of the ship, which we unspool out into the uh, into the ocean. It takes it took us about three days to put out all of the cable we used in, in our experiment. And this is my colleague, um, Maladin, standing in front of one of these empty reels after we'd uh, unspooled everything out into the, uh, to the ocean. So I always show this. This is kind of goofy. We did not go down the Hudson. But if we did, <laughs> then this would be, gives you a scale for kind of the, uh, the length of the, the amount of kit we had in the water uh, behind us. And then the, the source for our array were, were a series of um, air guns. So in our case, there was a. 36 um, gun array. The different guns have um, different volumes and are carefully timed to produce a signal as close to a ooh, excuse me to a uh, spike as possible. And so uh, we deliver compressed air to these things. They fire. They throw. They um, kind of inflate a gigantic bubble, which uh, collapses to create the um, the sound source. And so this I also like to show. You know, of course, we want we're making our own sound waves to try and image the Earth. But at the same time, Alaska is a very seismically active place. And so this is a um, recording from just one seismometer sitting out here uh, during our experiment. And all these little blips are the sound array of the Langseth. And then this was a magnitude 5 earthquake. <laughs> so the, the earthquake won. That data was not very good for us. I'm sure it was good for somebody else. All right, so just to give you a feeling for what these data look like, I'm now going to show you um, a reflection profile uh, across the plate boundary here. And first, I'll just show you the naked one, and then I'll put the interpretations on. But we're looking kind of you know, across the margin um, and basically kind of in pseudo depth here. So this is two-way travel time, so the time it would take sound energy to go down 
vertically, bounce off of a layer, and come back. And so here is the seafloor. This is the trench. This is the incoming oceanic plate. Um, but hopefully the thing you can even see at this scale is, um, is this and this. And, um, and this we know from comparisons with many other data to be the, um, the plate boundary zone. And so on all of our lines, we're able to image that um, 150 or more kilometers from the trench and to depths of about 50 to 60 kilometers. So it's really pretty amazing. We'll look in more detail at that in the, later in the talk. But, but first, since I've told you that the inputs to the subduction zone matter, we're going to kind of look at what's coming into this um, subduction zone. And one of the first things that we were able to observe here is that the inputs were varying a lot along the, along the subduction zone. So um, this is a profile that's a couple of things that are off of the Schumigan Gap. Um, so again, this is the area that has lots of small earthquakes, weakly coupled, hasn't had a big earthquake in uh, many years. And so this is a swath of um, bathymetry data um, offshore. And then this is the seismic reflection data um, that goes with it. And so of course, already in the bathymetry data, you can see you know, all of these lineations. And this is the, the surface expression of the, this normal faulting that occurs as the plate bends and subducts. Um, if we look at the coincident seismic reflection data, now we're again kind of looking at a cross section through the upper part of the, um, the earth here. Here's the seafloor. Hopefully you can see all this layered stuff. This are, these are the sediments that are on top of the plate. Um, they're not very thick, about a half a kilometer. And they're offset by lots of small faults. Hopefully you can see that in the disruption both of the seafloor and of this layering. Um, and uh, so the tons of bending faulting occurring off of the Schumigan Gap. In contrast, if we go a little bit further, go to the east off of the Semiti segment, it's a totally different story. Um, in the bathymetry data, you have this very smooth seafloor, not much evidence for, um, for faulting at all. If we look now in the reflection data, we see that you have a much thicker pile of sediment there, a kilometer to a kilometer and a half, and even thicker in the, in the trench, and, um, and very little evidence for this um, bending faulting that, um, that I showed you in the, in the previous slide. And so this, is, this change is happening over a relatively um, short distance, and so we you know, thought about you know, what can be causing these big changes in bending faulting off of this boundary, and the, one of the things that is changing over that area is the um, the magnetic or the uh, magnetic lineation. So um, now I've kind of superimposed on our subduction zone here uh, magnetic anomalies on the incoming plate, and hopefully what you can see is that uh, the, those lineations are oriented north south over here in the east and then transition to being east-west, um, to the west. And this kind of complex pattern is from some plate uh, spreading reorganizations about 50 million years ago. Uh, but the consequence is that um, the orientation of those lineations with respect to the trench changes a lot along strike. And when we think about um, seafloor spreading, normally the, the structures that are made in oceanic lithosphere you know, as a part of the seafloor spreading process would be parallel to these, to the ridge, and, and parallel to these um, lineations. And so what that means is that over here in the western part, you have kind of pre-existing structures within this plate that are kind of more <laughs> favorably aligned with the trench than you do to the west, where the, those pre-existing structures would be quite um, oblique to the trench. And I'm showing that here with this um, kind of black line. This is showing the angle between what we would expect the pre-existing structures in the oceanic crust to be and the trench. And so it's around you know, 20 degrees, 20, 30 degrees over here, and as high as um, 60 to 70 degrees over here. And so we think that this change in pre-existing structures makes it easier for there to be bending faulting here than here. And, um, and just as a confirmation that our um, seismic and bathymetric imaging is really seeing differences in bending faulting um, between these two places, um, this is now just showing the number of outerized earthquakes occurring, just, which I just take to be all earthquakes south of the trench um, along the margin here. And you also have many more outerized earthquakes happening over here than over here. So it seems like there's, this is, might be one contribution to the change and bending faulting that, that we see. All right, so one of the other things I told you earlier on is that we think that these faults 
our pathways for water into the oceanic lithosphere, into the crust and the, uh, the upper mantle. And so to kind of examine what consequences these variations in bending faulting have for hydration of the plate, um, we're going to use the seismic refraction data. So here are just examples of a couple of records from our ocean bottom seismometer. So these are showing um, distance from the seismometer um, to the shot. And, um, and so we have nice arrivals from the crust, um, reflections off the base of the crust, and refractions through the upper mantle. And we've used these to do uh, um, T wave tomography of the, of the crust of the incoming plate. And so I won't belabor that anymore, but be happy to answer more questions about the method we use. But, um, but basically, the, the thing that we see is that in the Schumigan gap, where we have more bending faulting, one of the most prominent features in the P wave velocity model that we obtain from the wide angle data is that there's a really, uh, so sorry, I should orient you here. These colors are showing um, P wave velocities. This is the, um, the seafloor. The kind of oranges and yellows are good crustal velocities, and the, um, and the purple is sort of a normal upper mantle velocity, you know, 8.1 um, to 2 kilometers per second. And, um, and one of the, the biggest things that you see in this uh, model is a really marked reduction in velocity of the upper mantle from something like 8.2 kilometers per second here to less than the almost 7.5 kilometers um, here. And um, similar reductions in velocity are seen in the upper mantle at, at many other um, subduction zones. More subtly, there's also a reduction in velocities of the, um, of the crust as well. Uh, but for this, this reduction in upper mantle velocities, this is observed at a lot of other outer rises at other subduction zones. And, and many things can influence the, an upper mantle uh, velocity. But in this case, we think that the most likely culprit is serpentinization, so a hydrous mineral formed by the reaction of water with uh, mantle rock. And when you form serpentinite, you reduce the, the P wave velocity. So this is showing um, velocity as a function of percent um, serpentinite. And so you know, with zero serpentinite, you're up here at 8 kilometers per second. But with increasing serpentinization, you reduce the velocity. And if it was 100% serpentinite, you'd be more like four kilometers per second. And so our, if we interpret our entire, this entire reduction in velocity as being a consequence of serpentinization, we would require about 16% serpentinization, which would be about 2% water. OK, so that's the Schumigan gap. If we come to the Samiti segment, where we had this thicker pile of sediments, much less bending faulting, it's, a, again, a kind of different story. So now we're again looking at the P-wave velocity structure here. Um, you have a much more complex structure, both in the crust and in the upper mantle. Um, we think this is, has to do with the orientation of the line with respect to the um, spreading direct, the paleo spreading direction, and uh, a difference in the accretion, the accretion rate of this oceanic crust compared to the oceanic crust on the other line. But the most important thing is that neither in the um, in the upper mantle or in the crust do you really have that same really dramatic decrease in, in velocity. Um, you have a lot of variability, but it's not like you have a, a, a systematic change. And so in, in our case, we think that um, the reason that you don't have this nice reduction in velocity here, as you do here, is that there are fewer bending faults to provide pathways for fluid down into the crust and upper mantle. So less faulting, less water stored in the plate. Okay. So now I've told you that I've um, been telling you about what's coming into these two parts of the subduction zone, that in the Samiti segment we have this thicker sediment pile, but um, basically a, a smoother top of the, um, the plate because there's not very much bending faulting and less hydration of the crust and, and upper mantle. Whereas in the Schumigan Gap, I sh I hopefully I convinced you that we have a much thinner layer of sediments. They're more disrupted by um, outer rise faulting. So you have kind of a rougher, more irregular top of the plate. And that you, because those of the difference in faulting, you have more pathways for water into the crust and upper mantle and more hydration of the plate. So why do we care? Um, what does this matter? So I th these different differences in structure may have impacts in, in different parts of the subduction zone. So you know, the, we think that the kind of shallow the changes in the thickness of the sediments, the changes in the 
roughness at the top of the plate and the sort of shallow fluids. These are things that are more likely um, to be important um, in the accretionary prism and in the seismogenic zone itself, so for the seismic process. Whereas, at least for the thermal structure of, of this subduction zone, um, differences in hydration of the, of the crust and especially the upper mantle are more likely to be important at greater depths um, for things like arc magnetisms and intermediate depth earthquakes. So now we can go and look at our subduction zone and see what impact these things may be having or how they might be contributing to the differences in behavior we see. And so we're going to first start with um, the deeper story and then we'll come back to the, um, to the shallower story. So um, I showed this map to you before. Um, you know, again, this is just seismicity from the Alaska Earthquake Center's catalog. And, um, and what you can hopefully see visually, if we just now focus on the, the, the deeper earthquakes here, is that there's more of these earthquakes um, kind of in the 100 to 200 kilometer depth range occurring down dip of the Schumigan Gap than in the Samiti segment. And so we can, you know, besides just looking at it, we can do some counting. So um, now what I'm going to show you are just um, uh, the number of earthquakes occurring along the subduction zone in different depth ranges. So the purple is the outer rise earthquakes I showed you before. Blue is less than 50 kilometers depth. Green is 50 to 100. And red is, is over 100. So we're going to kind of focus on these deeper two depth ranges for the time being. And to make things easier, I've I've, we've counted just the number of earthquakes occurring within a sliding one degree wide bend and um, in, in each of these depth ranges. And then I just normalized it by the largest number of earthquakes occurring in any of our bends in this area. So um, anyways, hopefully that makes sense. But basically you have more of these intermediate depth earthquakes occurring in the Schumigan Gap than the Samiti segment. And so it took me a little while, but I found my subduction zone here um, in Peter's <laughs> subway map. And, um, and so this is the Alaska Peninsula. And so what we learned from this is that we could expect there would be, you know, for water stored within this plate, we might expect dehydration reactions to depths of, you know, up to 190 kilometers or more roundabout. And that's, you know, broadly consistent with the kind of depth range of the, um, these deeper earthquakes that, that we're seeing. And so we think that one explanation for why you have many more intermediate depth earthquakes in the Schumigan Gap than in the Samiti segment is that you're bringing more water into the subduction zone, which is available to dehydrate and um, cause things like dehydration and brittlement, this local, um, locally elevating the pore fluid pressure and causing these deep earthquakes than you would have um, in the Samiti segment where you know, they're thermally identical, but you just have less water that's coming into the subduction zone and available to drive that dehydration and brittlement. I mean, this uh, mechanism for intermediate depth earthquakes is debated. It's, uh, some people think there are a variety of mechanisms that you could um, use that would um, reactivate old faults. And again, we think that would also be consistent in our case, that we might have you know, more faults available in the incoming plate in the Schumigan Gap that could be reactivated by various processes at depth and cause these deep earthquakes in Schumigan in the Samiti segment. So, you know, we think that this sort of local control on uh, by variations in the incoming fabric is controlling how much water is in the plate and might be controlling variations in these processes at depth. And so now I'm going to take a little more time and take you and think about what the impacts are of these. Um, of the variations in um, sediment thickness and, um, and kind of roughness at the top of the plate on, um, on processes that are happening in the accretionary prism and in the, um, and in the subduction zone. And so um, if we uh, look again here at our, our favorite map, um, just to remind you again that we see in the Smitty segment many fewer uh, events are happening um, not only in this intermediate depth range, but also of within the main seismogenic zone compared to the Schumigan Gap. Um, and so now we're going to kind of, oh yeah, so here if I, if we kind of look at that again, this is the same kind of figure of normalized number of earthquakes versus distance along the trench. And now I'm just showing the, the blue line, which are earthquakes less than 50. And this is just to say again that, you know, more of these potentially interplate events happening over here than, than here. And that, um, as I've tried to um, highlight, 
that the, uh, the other thing that's changing besides the, the uh, orientation of the pre-existing fabric is the amount of sediment that's um, potentially entering the, entering the trench here too. And so now what we're going to do is just sort of focus in and look at in more detail at um, first the, sh the Samiti segment, and we'll look at both the first the shallow structure and then the structure within, you know, deeper in the seismogenic zone here. And then we'll come to the Schumigan Gap and look at the shallow structure and then the deeper structure there and see how plate boundary properties might be changing between these two places that are behaving quite differently. All right, so to, um, to look at that, I'm showing you seismic reflection data that have been um, pre-stack depth migrated. So this is a, an iterative process that um, provides better imaging um, in really complex areas, but also yields a model, a pretty detailed model of seismic velocity. So again, um, P wave seismic velocity. And so we were focused out here before, and so now we're gonna look here. Um, but here's the, the seafloor, and, and I'm gonna zoom in in a moment, but basically this is the kind of plate boundary zone. But hopefully what you can see even at this scale is that um, there's kind of this reddish layer here. Uh, and this is associated with kind of lower velocities than the overriding material. But now we're gonna zoom in and really look at it. Whenever you show seismic reflection data in talks, people say, oh, I didn't see anything. So I'm gonna bring you to my computer and make you see it. <laughs> but um, so here's the seafloor again. Here's this incoming sediment, you know, which reaches um, as much as two and a half to three kilometers thick in the trench. But hopefully what you can see kind of, this, so this is the deformation front, is um, this reflection kind of discontinuous here, here, and here, and this reflection. And we think that this is sort of the top and base of a subducting sediment layer, which you can kind of see continuing from this incoming section. Some of the shallower sediments seem to just get plowed up into the accretionary prism, and you have all these nice fold and thrust faults. And all of these things seem to sort of sole on to this shallower um, reflection here. And so, um, so for these relatively low velocities we see within these sediments, we kind of went through a variety of ways that you could cr create such, have such a low velocity within this channel. But um, the variations in lithology don't really help you. Many other variations don't. But what can give you such low velocities is elevated um, pore fluid pressures. And so, um, oh, I could have given you those labels before, I guess. Uh, and so what we did is said, OK, let's say that this, these things are caused by elevated um, pore fluid pressure. What pore fluid pressures would you need to explain the velocities that we have? And so um, we calculated that by kind of an establishing a relationship between velocity, porosity, and effective stress and pore fluid pressure out here on the incoming plate, far away from the subduction zone, where we can assume that you don't have elevated pore fluid pressures. And then we use that relationship to then predict, you know, what velocities different overpressure conditions would give you in the subducting channel. So now we're looking at um, P wave velocity as a function of distance from the trench. And so the, the velocities within this channel here are shown here with these black dots. And the bars are showing our estimated um, uncertainties, which we, and we tried to be very, very conservative about that. And so you can sort of see that our velocities in that layer, they kind of gradually increase a bit, but mostly stay around 2.5 to 3 kilometers per second. And each of these colored lines is showing what velocities you would expect for different pore fluid pressure conditions. So, and it's expressed in terms of lambda star, uh, which is here. But basically, a lambda star of zero is no overpressure. And a lambda star of one would be that pore fluid pressure is equal to lithostatic pressure. And so um, hopefully you can, you can see that even within our uncertainties, that something in the ballpark of um, a lambda star of 0.6 is, would well explain our, um, our observations. But that basically some amount of elevated pore fluid pressure would be needed um, here in the shallow part. So um, we think that's what's explaining our, the velocities that we see. So we've been looking up here, but now if we go to, um, to larger depths, um, we can, in the Samiti segment still, uh, I'll sort of zoom in on this. We see that the plate boundary is, you know, instead of being able to see the uh, reflection off the top and bottom of a low velocity layer, we just have this really bright reflection. Um, I mean, this is amazing. This is like 15 to 20 kilometers depth. Uh, it's awesome. Um, but we've done some sort of waveform modeling of this 
reflection, and we find that for this too, we need it to be explained by a low velocity zone. But you know, here we have we're so much deeper and lower frequencies that we can't see a reflection off the top and bottom of it. But instead, it's something that would be like a thinner layer that's about our the best uh, fit is like 180 meters thick, you know, and a reduction of velocity about one kilometer per second. So, um, you know, one possibility for you know what that layer could be is that these sediments that I showed you before continuing to be subducted and further compacted. And so if we kind of compare what we got out of our waveform modeling with um, experimental measurements done at Penn State, they've measured velocity on the kind of compacted and metamorphosed sediments that we expect to be on the plate boundary here. And they're showing their results here, um, parallel and normal to the fabric. But the kind of velocities they get for these metamorphosed sediments from uh, you know, exposed subduction, subduction megathrust you know, the contrast between that kind of like five to five and a half with the velocities we have for this overlying layer could kind of produce this, this reflection. So here, just the contrast between subducted sediments and crystalline crust could kind of produce our, our reflection and we don't need to invoke elevated pore fluid pressure. So if you kind of put all that together, um, it kind of gives this sort of um, model. So, um, you know, at shallow depths, we have this thick overpressured pile of sediments, and these are these are the kind of conditions that we normally think of as inhibiting, you know, shallow rupture. So this would be stuff that would be um, kind of too weak to um, to support um, seismic slip. Whereas, you know, as that big thick pile of sediment goes down to larger depths, it compacts to form this sort of coherent and more homogeneous plate boundary at depth, and. Um, and that this might explain why you have very few earthquakes here. You have this sort of nice, even <laughs> distribution of thick sediments. They go down and compact and form a nice, large, continuous disparity at depth, which doesn't have a lot of little earthquakes, but can produce larger earthquakes. And so now if we kind of compare that with the Schumagen Gap, we've been all focused on the, the Smitty segment. Um, this is sort of a similar, yeah, also a, uh, image and velocity model made with the, the exact same methods as, as uh, this guy. And you see a very different structure again. So we'll zoom in on it now. But um, you don't, in, so you have, of course, this thinner, more faulted up sediment pile coming in. And then at depth, it's just a much more rough and irregular uh, kind of layer of reflectivity that's marking the plate boundary. You don't see a coherent layer of sediment there. Um, and, um, and uh, you also don't have uh, this really marked low velocity zone. And, um, and a lot of the structure, the accretionary prism looks very different, but a lot of the structures there seem to come down all the way to the top of the um, oceanic basement. So just you have less sediment coming in, less sediment on the plate boundary, and this much more irregular looking um, structure. Um, and so we can still, the, the only place where you could possibly see any subducting sediment is kind of in this, this shallow section. I, maybe I should have zoomed in even more. But when we look at it, we think there could be some little, little zone. Um, and if we you know, take those sediments and we play the same game and we estimate what their pore fluid pressure, what pore fluid pressure, sorry, you need to describe those, we really don't require any elevated pore fluid pressure at all. Lambda star equals zero is perfectly consistent with the kind of velocities that we have in that channel. So um, more irregular, less pore fluid pressure. Um, when we look at larger depths, it's actually a pretty complicated story. So I want to show you first just this is the, just the naked um, seismic reflection image of the whole subduction zone. But hopefully we've been focused up here, but at larger depths, hopefully you can see this. This is the top of the oceanic plate, and, and this is the moho of the oceanic plate. Awesome. Um, but there's also some other big structures in here, including this thing um, and the overriding plate. And um, so now we have many interpretations. Um, but basically, the, the first order thing is that um, in contrast to the Semiti segment, we have a, very, a much rougher and more heterogeneous plate boundary zone over all depths, you know, both um, in the shallow part but at larger depths. And that's kind of also consistent with the fact you have much more seismicity. It, it, isn't as, it also isn't really as reflective. And so having um, this more regular plate boundary might have mean that you have more small asperities that cause these, this more abundant 
smaller interplate, interplate seismicity that's observed. But then there's a bunch of other things here too, but this, this big feature I showed you before, this is associated with a large basin. And so this thing has mostly had a s normal sense of motion um, over its life and seems to be an active feature. Um, if we look at the bathymetry data over the top of this thing, we see a scarp at the, at the seafloor. This image didn't come out very well, but it also offsets the, the youngest sediments as we image them in the seismic reflection data. And there's a big cluster of seismicity here where it joins the megathrust. And this is from um, some relocations done at Cornell by um, Katie Karanen and, um, and Jeff Aber. So you have you know, a more irregular plate boundary and then these big structures in the, um, in the overriding plate. And, um, and so the, this kind of combination of features is something that is similar to what's observed in some very tsunamogenic places, including off of Japan, where they also had a very irregular plate boundary, including to very shallow depths, and had large structures in the overriding plate, which may have enabled, you know, sort of enabled or formed because of really large amounts of um, shallow slip. And so this area, the Shumigan Gap, as I've told you, has been a place that right now seems to be weakly coupled, hadn't had a great earthquake in 150 years. And so this is kind of a showing um, an estimate of past ruptures. So we've kind of been talking before about these more recent events in the last century. But from historical records um, you know, out here in the Alaska Peninsula and, and, and further west out in the Aleutians, um, it seems that there have been great earthquakes that did come through and rupture part or all of this subduction zone, including, and I guess particularly, a big event in 1788. And it seems like that ruptured into this area from the um, northeast and created a really large tsunami. And so, um, so basically, we, we think that the kind of structural configuration that we've imaged here, which is resulting we, a lot from what's coming into the subduction zone, you know, right now it's mostly creeping, but once in a while an earthquake can, we think, propagate into this area, and we think that this kind of structural configuration there could make it um, particularly tsunamogenic. Um, so now if we kind of add on to this uh, cartoon that I've really uh, stolen from uh, Billick and Lay, um, before I've shown you the Samiti segment, we have this thick sediment pile and less faulting coming in that you have a, um, you know, could have a pretty um, weak, uh, zone um, of, yeah, sort of weak, thick pile of sediment that wouldn't really favor seismic slip in the Smitty segment, but could subduct, and those sediments could compact and metamorphose to form a big kind of coherent asperity at depth, whereas in the Schumigans, we think we just have this more heterogeneous plate boundary over the, over the whole length of it. Um, and so that, you know, and that these changes in plate boundary properties, which may explain the changes in seismicity and behavior we see are really being driven by what's coming in to this um, to the subduction zone. So I guess my conclusion is my title that we think the diet of the subduction zone really is affecting behavior at many different um, levels. And in this area, we have a nice case study of there being large variations along the subduction zone and what's coming in. And that those you know, smaller scale variations and in inputs are leading to smaller scale variations in seismic behavior at depths throughout the, the subduction zone. And, um, and so we think these are a kind of important thing to think about. So, all right, thank you. Absolutely agree. Um, in fact, so there's, I, well, I'm not sure which is the right figure here, but yeah, we, 
I think that kind of water at different parts of the system is having an impact in different depth levels. So that, yeah, exactly, that the water stored in the sediment is sort of important in the really shallow part of the subduction zone within 10, 20 kilometers of the trench. But exactly, that it's water within the oceanic crust or upper mantle that's important at depth. And I have um, bugged um, Terry Plank a little bit, and we've looked at, um, she's sort of put together the, what we know about the um, chemistry of the volcanoes on the Alaska Peninsula here to see if we could see any geochemical geochemi signal of what's there. And it was, a, it was a very preliminary look, but she did um, see, and I, gosh, now I'm going to forget the, exactly which um, indicator she looked at. It wasn't, um, it wasn't that, but that it, it did, it was broadly consistent with what we're observing, but that's definitely somewhere we wanted to, to look. So yeah, I absolutely agree. Right. So, yeah, for this, the geometry of subduction zones, unfortunately, is really inconvenient <laughs> for active source, especially for dip lines. So we, yeah, we can only see down, you know, a few kilometers or so uh, below the um, base of the base of the crust. Um, Harm van Avendonk published a really nice study along the Costa Rica margin, and it was an along strike line. And there, he inferred hydration to depths of as much as um, 15 to 20 kilometers, if I remember correctly, of below the Moho. And so, um, and so I think that's a, a future direction, definitely, that we need to go is to design experiment geometries that give us deeper penetration. And I think a big part of that will be combining this style of active source imaging with with your kind of passive source imaging to actually really nail it down. Because, I mean, the other things that are uncertain too is we see this beautiful reduction in velocity. I interpret it totally in terms of serpentinization, but that's a big debate is you could also reduce velocity from um, just faults and some people think free fluid along the faults. Anisotropy is another important control. So I think that to really nail how much water there is, how it varies with depth, um, is going to require various kinds of seismology and um, kind of electromagnetic imaging. Yeah, the thickness of it. I absolutely agree. So I, I think that the historical record shows us that one way or another, you can have big earthquakes that happen within this um, subduction zone. In that case, it seems like it was from lateral propagation into this section from a you know, very locked submitty segment. Uh, I mean, the other Im important <laughs> answer to your question is that all of what we know about the locking here is from onshore GPS data. And those are really not very sensitive to locking that's, um, that's further offshore. And particularly, um, uh, Jeff Freimuller um, and, and a number of his papers has kind of tried to estimate how big of a locked zone could you put out here and we wouldn't see it. And it's something like 40 kilometers um, wide. And so I think that, um, yeah, a, a next important next step for this area is that, okay, we see these changes, have some idea of changes in behavior and now we see some changes in the structural configuration, but really how is this um, shallow part of the behaving? Because I, I think that's, that's a very important point. It's creeping now. It hasn't had a great earthquake in many years, but even from this historical record, we know that it can. So. 
Oh, thank you for asking that. I think I, I don't know if I put that in my bonus slides. No, I, I didn't say it. I absolutely didn't say it. So the, the reason is that there's a, um, both of them have kind of some layer of uh, pelagic sediment, but here there's an old fan that's the zodiac fan that's actually entering the subduction zone. So it was deposited, um, gosh, off of like Oregon and sort of much further south, and it's kind of been riding along and is now been subducting. No, it's not. So yeah, this is, from here out, it's, mu it's a much uh, thinner pile of, of sediment. So. You're referring to this one? Yes, uh, absolutely. I'm sorry if I didn't make that very clear. I think this is definitely no longer sediment, but is sort of a metamorphosed, subducted sediment. And so the, all that we can know about it from, from our study is to say, do some modeling to say, oh, how, how thick of a layer and what velocity contrast would we need to, to produce that layer? It is. It really is. Um, it, it's quite striking. And so at least. Our favored um, view of what this might look like is from comparing with exposed megathrust. Like, um, and so this plot here was showing work that um, Damien Safer and, and Peter Miller have done on a variety of samples from exposed megathrust that are just metamorphosed, sheared up sediment. And the velocities that they measure for those, the contrast between that and um, what velocities we estimate for the crust here, we think could give us this this reflection, but yeah, it's, we, yeah, our, our observables are only those couple things, so yeah, thank you for asking that, if I could make sure to clarify that. You know, we so that so we've thought that the serpentinite, since it's mostly a difference in the upper mantle, and based on thermal models like we know from Peter, we think that it's yeah that that water w wouldn't be released until much larger depths, and the serpentinite's kind of removed from the direct plate boundary zone. So at least we haven't thought it was important for um, the great earthquake process. It could be important for other um, deeper deeper processes. I hope I've understood your question correctly. But. And it is true that we Yeah, and so that's happening kind of on the, the top of the plate. But it is true that we have if we're right about the, the bending fault sea pathways for water under the mantle, but also the crust. You could have more hydrous minerals in the uppermost crust along the plate boundary and the, and the Schumacher gaps in the Schumidi segment. Yes, um, it is, he goes, oh, sorry not to make you relive my whole talk. Ah, yeah, so you mean the, these high velocities. So an, another um, kind of complexity of this area I didn't um, mention is that um, this crust was, form was accreted at a slow to intermediate spreading rate, um, and we're also, um, 
crossing that crust somewhat more obliquely to its fabric. And so I guess we felt like that the kind of heterogeneous structure of, of this plate could be due to um, it being formed at a, a slower spreading rate than this sort of fast spreading crust, which often produces more homogeneous constant thickness and structure plates. Um, we haven't thought in detail about the, these particularly high velocities. I will say that the lower crust of both of these is, is one of the most poorly constrained parts of the um, model, because they're not sampled by um, refracting waves. They're mostly constrained by reflections off of the, the base of that layer. So in our uncertainty test, we would put the, le the least faith in that part of the model. Thank you.